Our text today is taken from the 13th chapter of Revelation, beginning with verse 1. Today we're going to incorporate the text as we go along. A beast rises up out of the sea. The sea, we have learned, is the masses of the people. This is something rising up from the people, something that rises out of the masses. The word beast here is a stalking beast, a wild beast, a dangerous beast, a venomous beast. This beast is very dangerous and treacherous and concerning which we must take great care. This beast has seven heads and ten horns. Seven is the symbol of perfection and completion, and ten stands for whole sequences of things, times, areas, or whatever. Horns symbolize power, and heads represents the thought or the mentality or the philosophy behind the thing. Also, there's the symbol of crowns, which we know to represent rulership. And so we have a very dangerous beast that rises up out of the masses of the people, possessing complete authority and having universal power over the realm which he rules. His authority, so far as it extends in that sphere and in which it operates, is complete. And upon his horns, ten crowns, and upon his head, the name of blasphemy. That's first. Uh, one of the latter part of verse 1. It's the mentality of this creature to blaspheme. That is what is in his mind. That is his purpose. That is what characterizes his reign and his kingdom. He's going to blaspheme. This is the reason for his existence. That is the only world he knows, and that is what he is fully set to do. The blasphemy is upon his crowns. The instruction and the purpose of his kingdom is to blaspheme. It is their preoccupation, that is the kingdom of the beast, and they have no other basic agenda. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. First part of verse 2. And this symbol of the leopard has a dual meaning. It represents something that is very sneaky, cunning, clever, very quick, very dangerous. But it also represents something that is camouflaged and is hard to detect. If you have ever watched a nature film of leopards slipping along through the brush or standing in the brush, you know that their coloring is such that they can be standing there looking right at you, and you can look right at them, but you don't even see them until they move. That is because they blend into the scenery. They are so well camouflaged, they are very hard to detect. This beast blends into the scenery and goes largely unnoticed. And this leopard has great power, greater than usual. The second part of verse 2 says, His feet were as the feet of a bear. The bear throughout biblical history most often symbolically represents something with great power and ferocity. But he is not crude, this beast. He has great regalness about his bearing, and he speaks powerfully and with authority. The end of verse 2 says, His mouth as the mouth of a lion. Now we're all familiar with the symbol of a lion. It represents kingdoms, kingship, and rulership. And so this beast, which is very sneaky, hard to detect, and possessed of great power, speaks with great authority. He sounds as if he knows what he's talking about. He is very convincing. This beast gets his power, authority, and cunning, and license, and mandate to rule from the dragon. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. 
What we have pictured in the beast is the whole fallen world of humanism. Man and his devices, thoughts, philosophies, ideas, and ambitions. Remember that this beast rises up from the masses of the people. One of the areas where the Christian has been gullible and naive down through history, and particularly in the Western world during this era of the Age of Enlightenment or so-called Enlightenment, concerns the moral nature of the world around him. In the evangelical world, there's an inexplicable belief in the existence of an amoral, aspiritual world of thought and behavior. It's not of God. It's not of the Bible. It does not have the kingdom of God in its righteousness as its objective and preoccupation. It does not necessarily have anything to do with eternity, but it's a good world. It's the world of Western philosophy, the philosophy of the republic and of the democracy, the philosophy of the good life and of a social world that is wholesome and healthy and offers man something of real value, such as movies, sports, and social sciences. Even though acknowledgedly it's not of God, it does not come from the Bible, is not part of the church, it has nothing to do with the mission of the church, yet it must not be condemned as useless or evil. It is something that is good and something that is certainly worthy of dedicating your time and your energies to. If you give your all for it and die in a conflict trying to bring it to pass and to further its goals, there's sort of an immortality to it, like a soldier dying on the battlefield for his country. Now, I hope to be very plain in speech and articulate in words in telling you that from the position of historic Orthodox Christianity, this is absolutely an error. It is utterly false and untrue. There is no such halfway world, and there never has been. There is nothing more than the work of the beast, as Satan has given him his power to express rulership over this world. It is humanism in all of its ugly aspects. And its basic goal is to blaspheme God. Its basic goal is to blaspheme God. The power of this anthropocentric philosophism is that of Satan, the gory dragon. This is a program and a plan of Satan. And what is included in it? Philosophy, materialism, public education, historic sciences, all of these things, and many more. Each of them, each of them has one basic purpose. It's to drag man away from God and away from the truth of God. What is the heart of Western philosophy? What is it? Here it is. Man is sovereign, though the Bible says that man is not sovereign. According to Western philosophy, man has the right to self-determination, yet the Bible says man does not have the right to self-determination. They say that man has the right to rule his own life and to do whatever is necessary in order to escape persecution for the faith. But the Bible says man does not have any of these rights. They say that a man has the right to disregard the moral law, to divorce, to remarry, to do whatever he wants to do in his life and his home and his church, yet the Bible says that he does not have any of these rights. They say that man came from the lower forms, but the Bible says God created man in the image of God. They say there is no absolute moral law that has the authority to rule men's lives. The Bible says there is an absolute moral law given by God himself that has authority over men. What is it telling us? It is telling us that in every point, Western philosophy contradicts God and his truth. And what is the bottom line of this? 
Remember now that we're talking about something that is real and vital and that is all around us and everyday experience for each of us. So what is the bottom line? It's this. So you see why God and the Bible are not right. That is the end purpose of all of this specious information that is being pumped at us by the anthropologist, the sociologist, the philosopher, the scientist, the politician, the television producer, and on and on. And if you do not know that this is the goal, you are living in a mental and spiritual vacuum. You need to open your eyes and take a look because, my brother, that is what it is all about. That is what all of this disinformation and misinformation is designed to say. God is wrong. Can't you see that, you fool? How long will you cling to these old myths and superstitions? God is wrong. The Bible is wrong. We have proven it. That is what they are saying. But why is this the goal of the beast of humanism? Why? Because Satan gave him his power and said, go out and do what? Blaspheme God. Go out and blaspheme God. Do it with every word in your mouth, with every trick up your sleeve, and with every thought in your head. God is the enemy. We have to bring him down if we want to survive. It's either us or God. That is the goal of this so-called neutral world, which gullible and compromised Christians have been kissing up to and getting it on with like illicit lovers. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. Verse 3. Immediately after the resurrection and the beginning of the Christian church, the whole world was influenced by Christianity. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was common knowledge and was undeniable. 500 honorable leaders of the early Christian movement had seen him and watched him go and eat fish and in other ways prove that he was a physical reality and not a ghost at one time. No one, not even the anti-Christians and the Jews, were fool enough to try to deny it in those days. Even Rome, after a short time, even the Emperor Constantine came into the Christian influence, and he declared that the whole Roman Empire was Christian. He issued a decree, this emperor of the civilized world. He declared that it was all Christian. He marched his armies through the rivers and declared them all baptized and saved. He declared them to be the armies of the Lord, and he sent them out into the Christian realm to do the work of God. There was a time when it was fashionable in the whole civilized world to be Christian or to pretend to be Christian. Of course, most of this was false, but nevertheless, that is the way that it looked. It looked like Satan had lost his power in the seats of government of the world. So all-pervasive was the moral influence of Jesus Christ and his death and his resurrection and the church and its great power in the early days that governments of the world took up the cause. No scientist in the Western world from St. Paul until Lyle in 1830 doubted the literal six-day creation, the historicity of Adam, the reality of the universal Gen Genesis flood, the sovereignty of the Ten Commandments, or the inspiration, inerrancy, and infallibility of Christians. The insidious beast of humanism was dead, or so it was thought. But what do we see today? This beast who was wounded unto death has made a great comeback, has he not? Is there a Christian nation in the world today? Well, what happened? He was all but stamped out after the crucifixion, but he made a comeback. 
And with his comeback, everybody is admiring his kingdom. Everybody is on his side. Everybody agrees that you can't argue with it. You can't stop it. You can't do anything about it. All you can do is join in. Everybody, including the religious world, is worshiping at the pagan shrine of humanism. Christian apologetics is singing his song. The cult of modern translationism, headed up by a religious scholarship, has joined the attack on the Bible as the Word of God. New libertinism in the church regarding not only promiscuity and divorce and remarriage, but homosexuality and lesbianism, for heaven's sakes, are in the vanguard of those assaulting the sanctity of the Ten Commandments and the moral law. This is the way it is going. They're all joining the beast. You can't stop him. You can't do anything about it. Creation is no longer in vogue. Science has disproved the Bible. We have got to go along with it. And if you don't, you won't get your education. You can't hold a good job. You won't be anybody in this technical age. This is what they are saying. Is it not so? Verse 4 says, And they worship the dragon which gave power to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Who is like unto the beast who has made this great comeback and has reascended to the seat of power? And who can make war with him? In other words, who can do anything about it? St. John said, I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. The Greek word mia, which is the word one, can mean, it doesn't necessarily have to mean, but it can mean the first or the principal. In Revelation 9.12 it says, one woe is past, and the other cometh shortly. Many translators have said the first woe is past, because that's really the thought. Well, this is an allowable rendition of this word, and I believe is really the point here. His first head, his main head, his most important head, the head that controls the other heads, was wounded, as it were, unto death. He lost the ability to rule over the mentality and the thinking and the philosophy of men, but he has made a comeback. He has recovered from this apparent death blow, and now he rules over the thinking of all men. They are worshiping his beast, and they are saying, Who is like unto him, and who is able to make war with him? Verse 5 and 6, And there was given to him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Let's have a small quiz here. Do you know who controls the minds of the people in the world today? It's the people who control the flow of words. Listen to me now and listen carefully. Words are the most singularly important and influential thing in this world, and they always have been. I know religious men who say, I think sometimes that words are the poorest tools we have. Ah, yes, but they are invariably the people who want to talk all the time, and you can't get them to shut up. What they mean is your words are poor, so why don't you just be quiet and listen to me? Words are the most important, and even those who rail on them know it. That is why we have the written word, and that is why Jesus Christ was called the word. People's minds aren't swayed by examples and deeds. They're swayed by words. Someone will say, well, it wasn't what he said that made the difference with me. It was what he did. 
Is that so? Then why are you up talking about it? Why aren't you out doing what he did? The truth is, you hypocrite, that you're using his life as an occasion to get up and spout off. If the truth were known, you probably don't know whether he did anything or not. And if he did, what it was, and what's more, you don't care. It's an occasion for words, and you're not the first to discover that truth. The people who control the universities, the newspapers, the televisions, the radios, and the flow of thought, these are the ones who control the minds of people. A great mouth was given to this beast to speak great blasphemies. How does Satan work? He works through words. He works through philosophies. He works through ideas written and spoken. We do not see Eve, or Satan beckoning to Eve to follow after him and watch what he does. We see him whispering in her ear, Now listen, Eve. Buzz, 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 buzz. And this is how it goes. Now you think about this now. Think about this and all the lies which warp the mind. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Man is what he thinks in his heart, you see. Where does evil do its work? Where does the devil do his work? It's in twisting the mind and putting thoughts in the head with words. You can take the battlefield. He'll take the lecture hall, because that's how and where the war is really fought and won. The mind is twisted with words. And that, by the way, is how God sets forth his truth and competes against the error. Christ is the word, not the example. The word of God is powerful, and God gives more attention in the Bible to doctrine by far than to practical exhortation, because until you have it in your mind, you're not going to get it in your hands and your feet, you see. You have to know before you can do, and it is by words that you learn. Words are more important than anything when it comes to influencing imparting, understanding, giving people ideas. And that's where Satan has concentrated. You can just switch it on and listen to it 24 hours a day, coming at you, words, 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 words. What is it that the words from the mouth of the beast are saying? They are saying, you've got to do your own thing. And you've got to do what you want to do. And you've got to do what you feel and what feels good to you. It's constantly the same theme over and over again. You do what you want to do. You do what you want to do. Don't pay any attention to God. Don't pay any attention to the Bible. Don't pay any attention to the church. Don't pay any attention to mom or dad or to Judaic Christian ethics. You do whatever you want to do which is, by the way, and then, of course, they proceed to tell them what it is they want to do. You want to take drugs. You want to experiment. You want to have illicit sex. You want to escape these moral restrictions that uh, were made for you by a bunch of uh, old religionists. You want to try being queer, and on and on. It means sneaking around. It means stolen waters are sweet. It means bread eaten in secret places is a delight to the soul. It means all these lies that are designed to warp your mind, to create discontent, to make you feel sorry for yourself, and to get you to forget the truth of the Word of God. That is the way humanism works. It works through words, a mouth, speaking things and blasphemies. This phrase could be interpreted in this way, a mouth speaking great things which always result in blasphemy. That would be an appropriate translation. Great things, great ideas, great concepts, 
but they're always designed to do one thing, to blaspheme God, to come out against the truth, to create an imaginary new truth, Satan's truth, which is always the exemplification of the lie. But of course, he opened his mouth to blaspheme. That's what he's here for. Humanism has no other purpose and has never accomplished any other thing. It blasphemes God and it can only blaspheme God and truth.